normal circumstances, we would be meeting together. There would be a foot washing and we would share in Holy Communion. This obviously is not possible. But we will still hear the story of how Jesus washed his disciples' feet and shared a last meal with them. And then we shall hear the rest of the Passion narrative. On this night, our Lord Jesus Christ said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love each other as I have loved you. We sing together, A new commandment I give unto you, Singing the Faith 242. Let us confess our sins to God and ask him to cleanse us. Father eternal, giver of light and grace, we have sinned against you, against our neighbour and against each other, in thought, word and deed. In the evil we have done, and in the good we have not done. Through ignorance, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, we have wounded your love and marred your image within us. We are sorry and ashamed and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, Forgive us all that is past, and lead us out of darkness to walk as children of light. Amen. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we walk in the light... As he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 
This is Christ's gracious word. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Thanks be to God. the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe and returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should also do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. And now... Verse 31 to 35. Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you. You should also love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Thanks be to God. Rosemary will lead our reflecting on that passage of scripture. We began Holy Week with the story of the crowds thronging the streets of Jerusalem to welcome Jesus. They threw down their cloaks on the road and proclaimed loud hosannas to their king. But 
Jesus' actions on that day were not quite what they had expected. Instead of riding on a war horse, Jesus chose to ride on an untrained donkey, an animal reserved for kings in peace time. And now in the upper room, as the disciples have gathered for the Passover meal, Jesus does something quite unexpected again. The normal practice for the host of any meal was to wash the feet of the weary guests as they arrived. But there appears to be no sign of that happening on this particular occasion. John, who is the only gospel writer to tell this story, records the very dramatic action of Jesus when, during the supper, he gets up from the table, takes off his outer clothing, divesting himself of any power, reminding us of the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. Then Jesus pours some water into a basin and begins to wash the dirty feet of his friends. This is definitely not what the disciples expected. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and return to his heavenly father. And yet on this fateful night, he deliberately and symbolically illustrates by his action how he is willing to become a servant and humble himself, even to death on a cross. His dramatic action becomes even more astounding when you stop to think about whose feet Jesus is washing. Think of Matthew, the dishonest, even if reformed tax collector, a man unwelcome in the synagogue and plight society. Then Thomas's feet, the one who had his doubts and voiced them. And then there's Judas, the betrayer, with Jesus taking his feet in his hands with the same love he offered to all. Peter, too embarrassed to think of Jesus washing his feet. It would have served Peter's pride much more if he had washed Jesus' feet. But the washing of Peter's feet is symbolic of the cleansing from sin which he must receive from Jesus if he is to enjoy fellowship with him. On this night, Jesus tells his followers, I, your Lord and Master, have just washed your feet. You then should wash one another's feet. Jesus offers an example of humble service and completely turns the world's values upside down. If we take our thoughts further, can we imagine Jesus kneeling at our feet, cleansing us from the weariness of life and dirt of sin? Are we open to receive his love and forgiveness? Are we willing for him to serve us in order that we might serve others. It's often a deeper mark of humility to receive something from a friend than to do something for that person. We would rather be the person who gives rather than receives ministry. It feels easier somehow to be in control of a situation than to be at the receipt of the kindness of others. Jesus ministers to his followers out of a situation of vulnerability and demonstrates a love that is real, a love that is tough, a love that is practical. Jesus shares our life with us and calls us to love others in imitation of his love for us. Self-giving, not counting the cost. Jesus asks us to wash the feet of those who perhaps have no one to do it for them 
metaphorically speaking. We're not commanded to like everyone we meet. We are commanded to serve them, to see to their needs in the name of Jesus, so that others may see the love of Christ in all we say and in all we do, and may come to love him too. The words of a song from our hymn book remind us of our servant ministry. Brother, sister, let me serve you. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant too. We are pilgrims on a journey. We're companions on a road. We're here to help each other walk the mile and bear the load. I will hold the Christ light for you in the night time of your fear. I will hold my hand out to you. Speak the peace you long to hear. I will weep when you are weeping. When you laugh, I'll laugh with you. I will share your joy and sorrow till we've seen this journey through. When we sing to God in heaven, we shall find such harmony, born of all we've known together, of Christ's love and agony. Thanks be to God. Amen. We're now going to sing a hymn which reminds us of Jesus, our servant King. Not to be sad. 
Robin Sherwood will now lead us in our prayers of intercession and the Lord's Prayer. Father God, as we look over this Easter period, on this night, this night on which he was betrayed, your son Jesus washed his disciples' feet and say that they ought to be washed one another's feet. We commit ourselves to follow his example in love and service. Lord, hear us. Lord, humble us. On this night, Jesus prayed for his disciples. Be one. We pray, Lord, for the unity of your church. Lord, hear us. Lord, unite us. On this night, Jesus prayed for those who were to believe in him. We pray for the mission of your church. Lord, hear us. Lord, renew our zeal. On this night, Jesus commanded his disciples to love, but suffered rejection himself. We pray for those who are rejected and unloved. Lord, hear us. Lord, fill us with your love. On this night, Jesus reminded his disciples that if the world hated them, it first hated him. We pray for those who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, hear us. Lord, increase our faith. On this night, Jesus told his disciples that he was going to prepare a place for them. Remember in your presence all who have died. And those who have been bereaved. Lord, hear us. Lord, renew our hope and trust in you. We share the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the glory, the power and the kingdom be yours now and forever. Amen. As we have heard from John's Gospel the story of the washing of the disciples' feet by Jesus. 
So in a moment or two, we're going to hear from Mark's Gospel, the story of the Last Supper. We will then sing the hymn that has been part of our Lenten liturgy throughout these last few weeks. And then we will hear the narrative of the arrest, trial and death of Jesus. When we come to that part, we're going to ask you all to switch off your video, your picture if you're on computer, unless you're going to be one of the 12 readers who will take us through that story. Each of the readers, when they have finished their part of the story, will switch off their video too, until there's just my video left. I will pronounce the blessing and then our service will end. If we had been meeting together in church, then we would have used candles to reduce the light as the story went on. And then we would have left the building in silence. We have to do it the way we have to do it under today's circumstances. So first, instead of partaking in Holy Communion, we hear the story of the institution of the Lord's Supper, Mark chapter 14, and Rosemary will read for us. When it was evening, he came with the twelve, and when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him one after another, Surely not I. He said to them, It is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and all of them drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. We shall now sing, My Song is Love Unknown. <clears throat>
So if all of you who are not uh, one of the readers would like to cancel your video and maybe switch off the lights in the room where you are sitting so that as soon as we have uh, said these responses then the 12 who are reading can begin the story of the passion narrative. God is light in him whom there is no darkness at all. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and we love darkness rather than light. David Hughes will begin our reading. When they had sung the hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, You will all become deserters. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter said to him, Even though all become deserters, I will not. Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this day, this very night, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. But he said vehemently, Even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of them said the same. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took with him Peter, James, and John, and began to be distressed and agitated. And he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and keep awake. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet... Not what I want, but what you want. He came and found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Could you not keep awake for one hour? Keep awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again he went away and prayed, saying the same words. And once more he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were very heavy, and they did not know what to say to him. He came a third time, and he said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? Enough. The hour has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. Immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one that I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. And so when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. 
And then they laid hands on him and arrested him. But one of those who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching and you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. A certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and he ran off naked. They took Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests, the elders and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. But even on this point, their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But he was silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man, seated at the right hand of the power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. Some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, and to strike him, saying to him, prophesy. The guards also took him over and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, while Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she stared at him and said, You also were Jesus, the man from Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I do not know or understand what you were talking about. And he went out into the courtyard. Then the cock crowed. And the servant girl, on seeing him, began again to say to the bystanders, This man is one of them. But again he denied it. Then after a little, while the bystanders again said to Peter, Certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. But he began to curse, and he swore an oath, I do not know this man you are talking about. At that moment the cock crowed for the second time. Then Peter remembered that Jesus had said to him, Before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he broke down and wept. As soon as in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. They bound to Jesus, led him away and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply. 
So the pilot was amazed. Jesus and Barabbas. It was Pilate's custom at the festival to release for them any one prisoner for whom they asked. There was a man named Barabbas in detention, one of the rebels who had committed murder in the recent revolt. The crowd came and asked Pilate to observe his usual custom. He answered, do you want me to release the king of the Jews for you? He knew that it was malicious ill will that had prompted the chief priests to hand Jesus over to him. But the chief priests incited the mob to demand that he released Barabbas to them instead of Jesus. Pilate asked them again, then what am I to do with the king of the Jews? They shouted back, crucify him. Why? Pilate asked. What crime has he committed? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. Pilate wanted to satisfy the mob, so he released Barabbas for them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cahoot, and they clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him, and they began saluting him, Hail, King of the Jews. They struck his hand with a reed, spat upon him, and knelt down in homage to him. After mocking him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him out to crucify him. They compelled a passerby who was coming in from the country to carry his cross. It was Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Then they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha, which was the place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his clothes among them, casting lots to decide what each should take. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, the King of the Jews. And with him, they crucified two bandits, one on his right, and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, ah, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests along with the scribes were also mocking him among themselves and saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now so that we, we, we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, 
truly this man was God's son. And there were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger, and of Joseph and Salome. These used to follow him and provided for him when he was in Galilee. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth and laid it in the tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where the body was laid. May Jesus Christ, who for our sake became obedient unto death, even death on a cross, keep you and strengthen you this night and forever. Amen. Go in peace.